Good morning, everybody. Hey, it's a holiday weekend, and most of you have Monday off, right? Good. And you came to church on Sunday. That's awesome. Good for you. Good for us. Yeah. Welcome, welcome. Um, I want to say to those of you who are viewing online, thank you for viewing. I know many of you view every week. Uh, I can hardly think of a topic that's more relevant to today's culture than the one we're going to be dealing with this morning. So I'm glad you've tuned in. For those of you who've come, I'm glad that you've come. I want to say to those of you who are our first-time guests, thank you for coming this morning. Thank you for taking a chance on us and investing a chunk of your Sunday morning in a group of people that you probably don't know. Um, My name is Ron. I'm our current lead pastor. I also happen to be the founding pastor of this church. And uh, so it's a special privilege for me to get to teach us this morning about a subject that's so vitally important to our world. So if you have any questions about anything I'm going to say, you can uh, find me in the lobby afterwards, and I'll be happy. I'm, I'm a straight shooter, but I will say anything I say to you in love and hopefully in great kindness. Years ago, I pastored a church in a context that was so good for me and so enlightening. But in this context, the the tradition was that there was a group of chairs right behind the pastor up on the stage, and these were the deacons of the church And they were sort of like the bullpen for the home team, right? And their job was to keep up this continual chatter. Like a bullpen would say, come on now, select the right pitch. Don't swing at anything. Watch the strike zone. Pick your pitch. Keep your swing level. And there's all this chatter that continually comes to encourage the batter. Well, the deacons would say, come on now, preach it, brother. Now you're talking. And there was this, it was continual chatter. And then the pastor would say something a little controversial. And that chatter would all of a sudden go, well. (laughs) Can I tell you right up front, this is going to be one of those, well, kind of teachings. Okay? It's going to call us to think. It's going to call us to process some stuff that maybe sometimes we don't want to process. But as we do that, God has the ability to grow our faith. I want to talk to you about one other thing. This is a phrase you're going to hear over and over at New Life all year long and hopefully long beyond this year. And that is the way of Jesus. Jesus had a way of living that was so different from everyone around him. And his his most common invitation was really simple. Follow me. And that means he's inviting us to a different way of life. This whole series is called The Kingdom of Jesus. And the first five teachings are these healthy tensions that he calls us to walk in. And I'm going to start with some acknowledgments about the kingdom of Jesus. Take a look at the screen. The kingdom of Jesus is a beautiful, wonderful, messy place. Most of us like the first three adjectives, first two, but not the third one, right? Beautiful, wonderful, that's all good. Messy, not so much. Why is it that way? Because it's a mixture of heaven and earth. And in some ways, heaven and earth are like oil and water. They don't naturally mix very well. But in the kingdom of Jesus, we have the beautiful presence of Jesus and we have the beautiful presence of all of us broken people. 
Secondly, the kingdom of Jesus is filled with people and we each bring our own brokenness with us. You are beautiful and wonderful. But the truth is, like me, you have areas of brokenness in your life. And if you don't think you're broken and you're married... I know who you can consult, (laughs) okay? If you're not married and you have friends, I know who you can consult because we all have this brokenness in us. Thirdly, the kingdom of Jesus, in it, he calls us to hold some really high values that sometimes tend to pull us in opposite directions. And we've talked about a number of them and today we're going to talk about two more values that, that tend to pull us in what feels like opposite directions. And last of all, holding these values in a healthy balance or tension actually brings out the best in both of them. That's why we're talking about this. Now, in each of these tensions, we probably have an inner pull that draws us to one value or the other. Take a look at the screen and we'll look at these two truths. We probably have an inner draw or the second principle is, or we might have an inner distrust that causes us to fear one of these values more than the other. Now, the very first set that we looked at was the tension between love and truth. And those of us who tend to be very black and white oriented, right and wrong oriented, there aren't a whole lot of areas of gray. Everything is either right or it's wrong. We tend to look at love as that fuzzy thing that can confuse everybody. And we might even end up with a fear of love. And those of us who are very relationally oriented and are really drawn to people. And we love a very diverse group of people and and so forth. We might have a tendency to fear truth because truth might actually alienate someone we love. Now, probably never is this more true than in the subject we're going to talk about today. Take a look at the words on the screen. We're going to talk about unity and diversity. Even as I stand here, some of us have a fear of one of those words or the other. For those of us who want everything to be the same and everybody to be in lockstep, And can't we all just get along and agree and so forth? And we we want to forge a unity because it feels comfortable to us. And the whole idea of diversity scares us to death. And by the way, don't think that I'm just talking about racial diversity. I'm not. It's included in that, but that's not. For instance, there are some of us sitting right here today that are absolutely afraid of any sort of theological diversity. And we want everyone in the church to believe the same things and teach the same things and talk the same way and hold the same behavioral values. And we are absolutely threatened by any form of diversity when it comes to theology. Hmm. And some of us are absolutely afraid of any sort of unity because to us, we think we're going to be forced or we're going to be forcing other people to give up their individuality to just become part of a group. I think that's the collective, well, (laughs) yeah. Just putting those two words on the screen seems daunting. 
And it brings up for me this question, can we actually do this? Can we actually walk in unity and yet have great diversity? Is that possible? Well, I want to remind us of three statements that after studying the life of Jesus, we have concluded really describe how he interacted with people, values that he carried deeply within his heart, and they leaked out in all of his teachings. And these three statements, consequently, we have adopted as the heartbeat of our church. Take a look at them. They're on the, on the screen. First of all, everyone is loved. That's unity. Everyone is loved. This morning, no matter who you are, no matter what your background is, no matter what you look like, even no matter what you might believe or don't believe, you are loved. Period. No ifs, ands, or buts about that. You are automatically in our circle of love. And we will throw our arms around you and hug you because you belong here. Do you believe that? Yes, Yes, I believe that with all of my heart. And that's the way everyone seemed to be when they came into the presence of Jesus, no matter who they were. Because there was a wonderful unity. We're going to talk about that in a minute. The second statement is nobody's perfect. Guess what? That's diversity right there. We all have our own individual issues. And you know what? In the kingdom of Jesus, we don't hide them. We don't don't have a unity that's sort of a fake unity where we pretend I'm okay, you're okay, everybody's okay, we're good. We start from the premise, you're okay, but you're broken. I'm okay, but I'm broken. Because in the kingdom of Jesus, nobody's perfect. And we understand that. And we accept that. And we accept each other in spite of our brokenness. And then the third principle is the one where everything changes. Because we believe in the kingdom of Jesus, anything is possible. We can learn to walk in this love-bound unity in spite of tremendous diversity. That's what makes the kingdom of Jesus so special. Now, I think you'll all agree with the statement on the screen next. We live in a world of intense tribalization. Have you noticed? Oh, my goodness. We not only know how to select our tribe, we know how to execute people that are not in our tribe. Yeah. Have you heard of cancel culture? We live in the middle of cancel culture, where if you don't agree with me, and you don't vote the way I vote, and you don't believe what I believe, I will literally cancel you out of my life. I'll cancel you out of my Facebook account. I will cancel you out of my Twitter account. I will block you from my contacts list. I literally will cancel you out of my life. And somehow, I think I am more holy and righteous for doing that. Because I have taken a stand for what I believe. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. As Jesus taught on this subject, I'm sure that there were a few people that internally said, well, (laughs) yeah. But there's something else I've noticed about our world, and I don't want us to miss it. Because this could easily just be a haranguing teaching about how terrible we are as humans. And that's not true. Okay? 
Here's something else I've noticed. Take a look at the screen. And yet, there are times when we find this ability to transcend this natural tribalism and act with amazing unity, love, and compassion for those who are very diverse from us. I'll give you an example. You're driving down the road, and in front of you there's a terrible accident. And a car is spinning through the air, and there's, there's dust and smoke everywhere, and there's the horrible sound of a crash and screeching tires. And you pull over to the side of the road, and with all kinds of fear about what you're going to see, you run to the vehicles, and there are real people trapped inside. You do not ask yourself what gender they are. You do not ask yourself who they voted for. You do not ask yourself what they believe. You don't ask yourself if they've been living righteously. You don't even care if they're drunk or high out of their heads. What will you do? You will help you will somehow find a way to wrap your arms around them as best you can and to help them out of that car if that's what you can do or if they've been thrown from the car or worse yet, if they are breathing their last. You will find a way to hold them in your arms as they leave this earth. Because in that moment, you have chosen unity in spite of diversity. Am I right? Yeah. Wouldn't it be wonderful if it didn't take a tragic accident to bring that out in us? Wouldn't that be wonderful? That's what, thank you. (laughs) That, my friends, is what Jesus calls us to. Okay, here's a statement I don't want you to forget, okay? The kingdom of Jesus is called to be a model community because we live in this world of intense tribalism where people are taught to hate and distrust each other and to cancel each other out and we have been called to be a model community of what? Of transcendent unity. We're going to talk about what that means in a minute in the context of infinite diversity. Would you read that statement out loud with me? I want it to sink in. Ready? Let's read it together. The kingdom of Jesus is called to be a model community of transcendent unity in the context of infinite diversity. How do I know that? I just, I just want to go to something Jesus said, and I want to read it to you. Take a look. It's on the screen. Jesus said, I'm not praying. I'm praying not only for those, these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one. Just as you and I are one, As you, and Jesus was talking to his Father, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. There is no value that we can hold that will have impact on our world as much as the value of unity in the context of diversity. Jesus himself said so. And if we want the way of Jesus to influence and impact our world, then we must be living out this thing that Jesus prayed for, that we could find a way to be one in the context of being so different. Not only did Jesus say it, But the Old Testament prophets actually foretold it 
about the kingdom of Jesus. Take a look at what Isaiah said. There's a day coming when the mountain of God's house, that was Isaiah's way of describing the kingdom of Jesus that would come. When the mountain of the Lord's house will be the mountain. Wow. Solid, towering over all mountains and all nations will river toward it. Don't you like that description of people flowing, rivering toward it? People from all over will set out for it and they will say, and I so love this description, come, let's climb God's mountain. He will show us the way he works so we can live the way we're made. The Apostle John was given a glimpse of heaven. I want to read to you what he saw in heaven. John said, I saw a vast vast crowd too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language. How's that for diversity? Yeah. Standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. And you'd have to read the book, but that's Jesus. And they were clothed in white robes. They held palm branches in their hands. And by the way, palm branches were a sign of peace and togetherness. And they were shouting with a great roar, everybody's differing opinions. Nope. What were they shouting? Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. Somehow they had found a way to shout and sing together. Isaiah prophesied it. Jesus prayed for it. And John saw it in heaven. I want to take us to one more passage of scripture because you know what we're getting on this? We're actually getting the mind and the perspective of God on this subject. And this last is another prayer of Jesus. Jesus said, I have other sheep too. Can we stop right there? I know some other sheep kind of people. It's the other sheep that drive me nuts. (laughs) I just want to make sure we don't miss that. Jesus was saying to his closest followers, I have other sheep. Oh, I think that's when they went, well. (laughs) Now, look, look what he prayed. They are not of this sheepfold. They look different. They're a different variety. They might even eat different kind of sheep food. And they have different kind of wool. Huh. And he said, I will bring them also. And I'll build a special pen for them. Is that what he said? No, 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 no. He said, They will listen to my voice and there will be how many flocks? One. And how many shepherds? One. Hmm. Now let's dig into our culture for just a minute. Okay? Our culture keeps looking for unity around either prevailing agreement or mutual tolerance. Prevailing agreement, okay? Let's talk about that for a minute. Take a look at two principles. Prevailing agreement assumes that if we discuss something long enough, we'll eventually come to agree about it and we can unify around our agreement. I want to quote Dr. Phil here for just a minute. How's that working for us? (laughs) Have you tried that at a family gathering recently? No, because here is the actual truth about trying to unify around agreement. And it's in the second principle, a unity based around prevailing agreement actually excludes those who differ from us. It's actually a unity based on exclusion, not inclusion. 
and I will unify with you as long as we agree. But if we disagree, I'll cancel you out. Hmm. You see, prevailing agreement has no power to actually create unity. I want you to think about this for a minute. It's not in the notes. It's not even possible to have unity unless there is disagreement. Because if everybody agrees, all you have is uniformity. You don't actually have unity. Unity can only be found in the presence of diversity and disagreement. Okay? Let's talk for a minute about mutual tolerance. Because that's our favorite thing in our world today. Tolerance. We have to learn to tolerate each other. Yes. We have any married people in the house? We have a lot of married people in the house. How many of you are willing to build your marriage on mutual tolerance? Don't you? <laughs> there has to be a little bit of that, but there has to be way more actual love. Right? Because mutual tolerance at best has the ability to enable us to peacefully coexist. Where you can believe different from me and I won't shoot you. Yes. We'll peacefully coexist. But there's no real unity. Why? Because it lacks the power to actually forge any real unity. And all you have to do is look at our world that is so filled with tolerance, and yet at the same time, it's filled with tribes who all tolerate each other. But there's no real unity. Now, Jesus came to give us a different way. I want to talk for the next few minutes about what is transcendent unity. Okay? Transcendent means it's the, there is... It's centered on a value or a truth that's higher or greater. That's what transcendent means. It means above all, okay? That is more powerful than anything that divides us. What if our love for Christ, our desire to follow him, our allegiance to Jesus was so powerful that it was more important to us than whether we meet on Saturday or Sunday? What if it was more powerful to us than whether we believed in eternal security or we didn't? Whether we believed in the rapture or we didn't? Whether we believed in predestination or we didn't? And I apologize for throwing out some theological terms that some of you are going to look at me like, what's that? (laughs) Well, what that is, those are the things that churches often divide over. Those are the things, well, let's get a little more personal, okay? What if our love for Jesus And our love for fellow human beings was more powerful than our opinion about their behavior or their morality. Yeah. You see, Jesus calls us to a place of transcendent unity. Where no matter who you are, I want to tell a story on a good friend of mine. He doesn't happen to be here this morning, but many of you will know him, and I'm not talking out of turn because he has told this story publicly many times. But there's a wonderful gentleman who comes to our church who has tattoos on top of tattoos. 
Okay, his name is Rich Denny. He has tattoos on his knuckles, on his earlobes. He's got tattoos everywhere. The first Sunday that Rich came to our church, he was absolutely internally petrified that he would be rejected by church people because he looked so different. Well, miracle of miracles. Someone told him, we should go check out New Life. I don't think that'll happen there. He's like, yeah, right. (laughs) So Rich shows up here on a Sunday morning and our greeters greet him and they hug him. Come on in. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. Uh, Enjoy the service. And he's like blown away. He was so blown away, he decided to come back the next week to see if it was a fluke. (laughs) Little did he know what was in store for him. He comes back the second week, and one of the greeters is greeting him, and after hugging him, says to him, hey, would you like to be a greeter in our church? I kid you not, you know what his response was? Have you seen me? And the guy said, yeah, I have. That's why you'd be a perfect greeter in our church. And he said, it hit me like a ton of bricks. If this church would let me in, they would let anybody in. Can I tell you? I love that our church makes a legitimate attempt every week to be like Jesus. Yeah. Transcendent unity centered on a value that's greater and more powerful than anything that might tend to divide us. It's not found in agreement or tolerance, but what is it found in? It's found in love. Yes. And when we learn to love people and not just tolerate them, when we learn to love people that we might even or probably do disagree with, we have begun to be like Jesus. Paul knew this. Look what he wrote to his people in Thessalonica. May the Lord make your love for one another. What's the next phrase? And for whom? All people. Not all people like you. Not all people in the church, not all people who disagree with you, I mean, who agree with you, may your love for all people grow and overflow just as I love, our love for you overflows. Paul further wrote to the people in Ephesus, his friends. He said this, I urge you to lead a life worthy of your calling for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle By the way, it's hard to love people who are different from you unless you are humble and gentle. Have you figured that out? Yeah, it just won't happen. He goes on to say, be patient patient with each other, making allowances for each other's, what's the next word? False. And how can you do this? Because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. And he goes on to say this, for there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of of all, who is over all and in all and living through all. Don't you love that passage? Yeah, we as people have been called to be one. So what does transcendent unity look like in real life? Well, first of all, I'm going to show you what it doesn't look like. But this is how it's often, this is how we attempt it often in the big C church. Take a look at this. It's called bounded unity. Okay? And we draw, see that red circle? That's our boundary. Inside the circle are the people we accept. Outside the circle are the people we reject. 
Inside the circle are the people who belong in our church. Outside the circle are people that we think don't belong in our church. And so what is that boundary? Well, I want to give us several, several possibilities. First of all, the more holy and righteous churches would tell you that's a theological boundary. And we have to hold the theological truth and we have to lay down the theological law and we're going to teach people the theology and if they don't believe it and they don't buy in, they don't belong in our church. Some churches, it's a social boundary. If you're socially mainstream, you belong there. If you're not socially mainstream, well, there might be other churches for you. In some churches, it's a political boundary. I can show you churches where you better be a Democrat or you will not fit. I can show you churches where you better be a Republican or you will not fit. In some churches, it's ethnic. When I was a kid, we went to a church in a state south of the Mason-Dixon line, and we, ha we had an African-American lady with us who had a beautiful singing voice and could stir a crowd with her voice. We walked into the church building and they met us at the door and they said, all of you are welcome here, but she cannot spend the night because it's against the law in our county for any African-American to sleep in our county overnight. Hmm. In some churches, it's a gender thing. I like to refer to these churches as the good old boys club. If you're a good old boy, you can do about anything in that church that you want to. But if you are female, you will be relegated to a handful of tasks and mostly in the corner. In some churches, it's a behavior border. You can't do this and you can't do that and you can't do this and you can't do that. And if you do this and you do this or you do this, well, you're not going to be welcome here. You're just out. There's a good illustration for this. It's a horse corral. In a horse corral, the idea is to get all the accepted animals on the inside and all the unaccepted animals on the outside. Correct? Correct? And you focus your attention on the animals inside the corral and you try to protect them from all the animals outside the corral. And your job is to keep these animals safe. And the only way you know how to do that is to create an us and them mentality. <coughs> Jesus had such a different way. I want to talk to us for just a minute about a Jesus-centered unity instead of a bounded set unity. A Jesus-centered unity looks like this. Jesus is at the center. And we're not trying to figure out who's in and who's out, who's saved and who's lost, who, who belongs here and who doesn't belong here. We start with the understanding that every single human being is broken and every single human being deserves to be loved by Jesus and his followers. There are no boundaries of love. Does that make sense to everybody? That's the way it's supposed to be. Okay. There are no boundaries of love, and we're all finding our way to Jesus. But there are people who will not find their way to Jesus, and guess what? They self-select out. They do it on their own. As long as we continue to call people toward Jesus, there will always be people who do not want to follow Jesus. It's part of their brokenness. But we don't have to reject them. 
they will self-select out for the most part. There's a tiny handful of cases in Scripture where the Scripture had to actually, where the church had to actually exclude someone. And I'm not going to deal with those cases this morning. I want you to know there, there are a handful of cases, and there are very few, and they're very far between, and there are very specific reasons given for that. But for the most part, everybody should belong. And there's actually a wonderful picture of this in nature. It's a Serengeti water hole. Because in a Serengeti water hole, there's something that draws all these diverse animals to the same place. That particular picture was taken over a 26 hour period of time and it was all blended in together so that you and I could see all the various different kinds of animals. And I'm sorry I couldn't make it larger, that's just how it is, okay? But there's animals that don't get along at all normally in nature, but they're drinking from the same watering hole. You know why? Because they have a need to live and they have come to the source of life for them. Let's back up one slide. What's at the center of a Jesus-centered unity? Jesus. And guess who comes to Jesus? All sorts of people because they recognize they have a need for life. And it's not working for them where they are. And they don't know how to agree on all this other stuff. It's not important to them. What's important to them is that Jesus has life for them. And when the church decides to be less like a horse corral and more like a Serengeti water hole, it will begin to live out its mission to be this wonderful place of unity in the context of infinite diversity. Does that make sense to you? And where Jesus is the center, it's great. Now listen, Jesus didn't struggle with this, but his followers did. And Jesus told him a story one day that gets very little press in the local church because it gives us an awkward message. Okay, here's the story. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night as the worker slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat and then slipped away. And when the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. And the farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, the field where you planted the good seeds is full of weeds. Where did they come from? Notice what Jesus says. An enemy has done this. The farmer exclaimed, Now look at what the workers wanted to do. Should we pull out the weeds, they asked? Make this thing a horse corral? Get all the wrong animals on the wrong side of the fence? Should we pull out all the weeds? And Jesus said, no. Huh. You'll uproot the wheat if you do. Let both grow together until the harvest. Then I tell you, the harvesters will sort out the weeds and bind them into bundles and burn them and put the wheat in the barn. Now, listen to me. Jesus is saying that in a healthy church, there will be weeds. Got it? We got to be okay with that. It's not our job to sort out the weeds from the wheat. It's our job to love everyone who comes and recognize if you think you're wheat today, you were a weed once. Got it? And thank God somebody didn't jerk you out and throw you away. Because when you and I think we need to go through the church and pull out all the weeds, we're going to be pulling up people who eventually would be wheat if we would just let them grow and be exposed to the influence of Jesus. 
Hmm. Notice this. His disciples didn't get that. (laughs) John said to Jesus one day, Teacher, we saw someone using your name to cast out demons, but we told him to stop because he's not from our group. He doesn't have our kind of wool. He doesn't eat our kind of sheep food. And when he, when he opens his mouth and baths, it has a different sound than all of us in this place. Jesus said, don't stop him. For no one who performs a miracle in my name will soon be able to speak evil of me. You know what Jesus is saying? That guy might be a weed now. But he could be wheat soon. Anyone who is not against us is for us. In bounded unity, differences are a threat and they must be kept to a clearly defined minimum. In Jesus-centered unity, differences are celebrated as a beautiful part of God's design And they are considered a normal part of finding our way to Jesus. We're all going to do that at a different speed, at different times, and in different processes, because we are all infinitely different. Paul wrote to his friends in Galatia and Colossae, and I kind of dovetailed these passages so that we would get the full import of both. You are all children of God in Christ Jesus. So put on your new nature. Let me just stop right there. Jesus is saying through the Apostle Paul, when you and I decide to become followers of Jesus, we have our old broken human nature that tends to be divisive, And it tends to hang out with only people like us. And it tends to cancel out people that are different from us. And it tends to have us force our own way on other people. But when we become followers of Jesus, we put on a new nature. It's the Jesus way. He goes on to say, and be renewed as you learn to know your creator. And become like him. More like him, less like us. In this new life, there is neither Jew or Gentile. There's neither barbarian or Scythian, male or female, slave or free. Let's stop right there. Okay? A lot of that doesn't mean much to us because we didn't live in that world. The Apostle Paul was dealing with the social barriers that divided his world. And if he were alive today, he would be saying there's neither Republican nor Democrat. There's neither liberal nor conservative. Okay, you got it? I could go on with a whole bunch more things that are true in our culture. Let's take Jew and Gentile. Jews were monotheists. Gentiles were polytheistic. The Jews had one God, and you could not see him. The Gentiles had many gods, and there were statues and images of of literally thousands of them. They were like night and day different. They ate different foods. They dressed differently. They, They spoke different languages. I mean, they were worlds apart. And yet Paul said, no, 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 in the church, we didn't build a corral over here for the Jews and a different corral over here for the Gentiles. Because in Jesus, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. He goes on to say, there's neither barbarian or Scythian. How many of you ever met a Scythian? Yeah, none of us. How many of you ever met a barbarian? I'll bet you met some of those. Yeah, okay. Barbarians were uncivilized people and Scythians 
were very sophisticated warriors. One stood for the warrior elite and the other stood for the marauding hordes. In Christ, there's neither. He goes on to say, there's neither male nor female. Oh my goodness. We could preach a whole sermon on each one of these little couplets. Neither male nor female. The implications of that are huge. He goes on to say, there's neither slave nor free. Can you imagine a church where here's a slave owner and a slave and they go to the same church and the slave is made an elder of the church and the slave owner is not. How do you say awkward? That's pretty awkward. But that's how it is in the kingdom. Okay? Why? Because Christ is all that what? That's transcendent unity. When Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. As we bring this to a close, on behalf of the leadership of our church, I want to make a promise to all of you here and all of you viewing online, okay? And here it is, at New Life, we choose to be a Jesus-centered community of transcendent unity in the context of infinite diversity. Are you on board with that? Yes, absolutely.